You haven't won yet. Yeah? What's up Carp Freaks? Welcome to the September instalment of Carp Life and welcome to my home. I'm not on the bank this week. Instead, I'd kept this week free in my diary to allow me to do some work down at my lake. And that's where I'm headed shortly. So I'm gonna finish my bowl of porridge, get changed into my scruffs and you can follow me down to the lake. So here we are down at my lake, Waynestones Pool. Now, it's been a while since you joined me here. Um, I was here last with you in the July episode and it looks very different now to what it did back then. It was um, very heavily weeded uh, through the summer, but by applying the blue dye, that's managed to control it nicely. Uh, and now there's just a few bits of weed in the margins. Um, but I am here to do a few essential jobs today. But before I get cracking, let me tell you what I got up to at the start of September. So having been back from Disneyland Paris for all of 24 hours, it was time to film another challenge. Now this one had been a long time in coming. We hadn't actually filmed one since March when we were down at Cuttle Mill. Um, but this one uh, was something I was really looking forward to. It was a great challenge suggestion, um, kind of based around the Matt Hayes, Mick Brown, great rod race, whereas I needed to catch a, uh, a weight of carp that would equate to mileage to get me home. Now, the venue we started at was Old Mill Lakes, uh, in Market Raisin, Lincolnshire. And it's a place I'm very familiar with. Um, and the challenge couldn't have got off to any better start. That's a huge fish. <sighs> right. I think Harry and I are both going with a guesstimate of about 37 pound. <sighs> Yeah. Not too bad. <laughs> 37 pounds, six ounces. What an absolutely amazing start. I really was not expecting that. Not at all. I'm a little bit lost for words, to be honest. This challenge really couldn't have got off to, to any better start. Less than two hours on the clock, and we've got over 37 pounds on the clock. <laughs> this is, uh, well, this is the biggest carp I've caught this year. It's the biggest carp I've caught during the challenges, not including the, the special challenges. And yeah, I'm absolutely blown away. What an awesome looking fish it is as well. 
incredible looking common. Oh yes. <laughs> I don't really care what happens now to be honest. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with this. I really am. Well having caught that 37 pounder so early on, I think Harry thought this was going to be a walk in the park, but I knew that wouldn't be the case. Um, I know what the fish are like in, in that birch lake. They respond so quickly to any angling pressure. And um, going into that first night, things were actually looking very promising. There, there, there was fish still in front of me and feeding, lots of activity in the swim. But when I woke up the following morning, there was no signs of anything at all. Um, and then it became a, a bit of a struggle. I started having to, to chase around a bit. And from my past experience on there, once you start chasing the fish, they seem to become a bit aggravated by it and, and tend just to switch off. Um, had I have just been able to stay put and I had time on my side, I dare say I may have been able to, to catch another one. But with, with it being a bit of a race against the clock, I had to make the decision to, to move to another venue. And very luckily we found out about a venue uh, not far away, which is where we actually um, we fished on the last episode of Carp Life, that farm reservoir. And um, that was a mega stroke of luck, being able to fish there. Um, we got, got a few, few fish under the belt, a few miles on the clock, and from there we were able to go to Pool Bridge Farm in York. Now, I'd fished Pool Bridge Farm Q Lake quite a lot over the years, and it can be very prolific, which is why I wanted to, to make my way over there. Um, but that wasn't the case on our visit. Um, on the few days leading up to our, to our session, it fish very, very tricky with just a handful of fish caught. And while we were there, I think just one other carp landed. Um, for whatever reason, it was just in a, a very, very dour mood, as were lots of venues across the country at that time. Um, did manage to catch one carp though, uh, just under 20 pounds, which was vital pounds and uh, vital miles on the clock. But from there, I decided to go to another one of the lakes on the complex. And this was the, uh, the Carp Lake, a small pool, which I had actually fished many years ago as a, as a boy, I think it was about 11 or 12, uh, and I blanked on that occasion. Um, but this time I didn't have any problem catching fish. Uh, there was plenty of carp in there, albeit small ones, but again, it enabled me to put a few more uh, pounds on the tally and miles on the clock. And I was able to get the, the mileage to see me home. Um, Unfortunately though, it wasn't quite in time. Um, the traffic built up on the way home. Yeah, I remember it was a, a, some real torrential rain which just slowed everything down, lots of spray on the roads. And unfortunately, I, I think I was about 11 minutes short of, of passing the challenge. Well, I'm home, but unfortunately, I'm not home. Soon enough, I always knew this one was going to be going to be tight, but um, not quite this tight. <laughs> I mean, that's that's how close it was. I needed that journey home to go really, really smoothly, but uh, it's. Hello, you alright you too? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you alright? <laughs> I, um, I needed the journey home to go really smoothly. It started chucking it down about halfway home, loads of spray on the road, traffic was slow. Um, not that I'm making excuses, I should have just caught more fish, shouldn't I, I suppose? So I guess all that's left for me to say is I'm absolutely gutted, but it's challenge failed. What? Didn't you pass? Well, you two start, <laughs> kids. Um, so it was, it was very, very frustrating, you know, being able to achieve the weight, the mileage to see me home, but not quite doing it in time. So really, in my eyes, I sort of failed on a technicality. It was, you know, the challenge shouldn't have been against traffic. It should have been about the fishing, and I managed to do that. So uh, yeah, it's a, it, it's a fail, but. Um, it was a pass really, wasn't it, I suppose. <laughs>
The following week I was down at Stanick Lakes for more tutorial sessions and I started things off with Ben over on Mallard Lake. Um, now when we arrived the whole complex had been fishing pretty tricky but Ben managed to catch a really nice common in the early hours of the morning but after that we really did struggle to find any signs of feeding fish so we headed over to Swan for the last couple of hours of the session uh, for a little bit of stalking and again he managed to wrap it up with a nice plump common stalked just a few feet from the bank. Thank you Mark. Well done. I know it's been, it's been excellent. I've enjoyed Good. every minute of it. Oh thanks so much. Yeah. I then had Chris and Matt for 48 hours over on Elson's Lake. Now Elson's is the, the trickiest lake on the complex but the lads wanted to learn more about fishing these lower stocked, high pressured venues as well as fishing in weed and Elson's really did tick all those boxes. Now I regularly get asked um, what sort of areas I'm looking for when I'm fishing on, on Elson's or, or, or any venue for that matter um, and, and the honest answer is just where the fish are. Um, if the fish are showing in an area and that area happens to be weedy then I'll just fish there. Um, I know in a lot of these sort of situations, a lot of people maybe opt to look for a, a clear area uh, in which to present a rig as close to the weed as possible. But that, that isn't where the fish are. If the fish are showing in the weed, then you need to fish in the weed. And that's what happened on this occasion. Um, in Chris's swim, we saw a couple of fish showing. Uh, and having fished that swim before, I, I knew that there was no clear areas out there. I knew it was just blanket weed covering the lake bed. Um, so we rigged up with a, a hinge stiff rig on a long supple boom and uh, we're fishing with um, Pacific Tuna cork ball pop-ups and once the fish had sort of finished showing we then put the rig on top and, and put some bait on the area. Now you could say why don't you put a rig on there straight away. Again in, in past experience uh, these fish are, are pressured fish and you know by casting at them and, and baiting at them they're only going to move off so instead we waited for the fish to stop feeding and move out the area on their own accord and then sneak a rig back on that same place um, chances are they will return if there's something there to keep them occupied if there's, if there's a reason for them to visit that area in, in in which case it must have been with natural food or something then they're likely to want to return again um, so we snuck a, a rig in on that same spot with about six or seven spots of bait and it wasn't that long before Chris received the first bit of action. Go, get in that net. Yes, nicely done. Piss me, piss me. Awesome mate, awesome. So Chris's first fish of the session. We said that right up to go, didn't we? We're watching we're one head and shoulder right on the spot, there was a bit of fizzing going on. And five minutes later, ripped off. Nice start. Buzzing. Now in these weedy situations, I guess a lot of people maybe he's up for a helicopter rig or a choddy. Um, but that isn't really my favoured approach at all. For me, there's just too much movement before the fish feels the weight of the lead. And I do think that they, they get away with it more often than they don't. Um, so I always prefer a, a hinge stiff rig fished on a long boom um, and a leg clip set up with a heavy lead of, of four ounces plus. Um, I adjust the, the length of the boom depending on the height of the weed I'm fishing over. So if it, if it happens to be the weed like two foot, then obviously I'd fish a, a two foot and a bit boom and then have a doubled over uh, stiff section on the end, which I think the fish have great difficulty in dealing with. And um, it's worked so well for me in the past and, uh, and thankfully it wasn't too long before Chris caught another one. So here's Chris with his second fish of the session. Another awesome looking common. This one's a bit bigger though. 2412, I think yeah, it was, this 24, one. 2412, yeah. Awesome. Proper old dark Elson's common. Well done, mate. Now, up until this point, I hadn't actually fished myself, and it wasn't until my final night down at Stanick that I actually got the rods out myself. And I'm really glad I did. Have a look at this old beast, 28 pound, 
eight ounces this proper gnarly old warrior this fish came from the, the far margin I just cast a lead over to the far side walked around picked it up put a rig on and just dropped it underneath under the bushes just a handful of freebies around it and then uh, shortly after first light this old fella came along really chuffed with that well I'm just down at the stock pond just about to, to feed them and I'm just feeding them with a with a mixture of pellets really two different sizes the light coloured ones they're a, a very low oil pellet uh, and the darker ones are, uh, are higher but they're still not as high as a trout or a halibut pellet now that we're going into the colder months and the water temperatures reducing all the time I don't be feeding any anything high oil because it's very difficult for them to digest as the oil tends to congeal in the, in the cold temperatures so yeah I'm not going mad just a few scoops in a few spots and that's all they're getting at this time of year I'm also feeding the fish in the main lake and uh, once again I'm still using the mixture of pellets that I'm putting in the stock pond uh, and I've also got a few kilos of boilies as well I've got some uh, some live system here so I'm only baiting a few spots each day and the spot varies I'm not feeding them just in one area all the time I'm just feeding them in, in spots that I know the fish are, are visiting. Um, I don't want to be putting bait where there's no fish and it's sat there for a few days before it gets eaten. You having one? Nah, I'm alright mate. I've actually got a very interesting story about this spoon. Yeah? I have, yes. Right. When I was fishing at Stanick Lakes, I think a couple of years ago now, um, I saw something glinting in the mud but just a tiny, you know, shimmer of silver. And um, I tried sort of picking it out with my fingers. There was only like, like that sort of visible. I tried picking it out with my fingers and it was well in, it was well in. But being the magpie that I am, thought it deserved a thorough investigation to see what this was. So, what I did, I got a team of experts with their 3D scanning device in and they could see that yes, this was an object of great significance. So having carried out a thorough survey um, of the site, um, I then had to gain permission off the landowner, Phil, to carry out excavation. <laughs> um, and this was done with impeccable, impeccable detail. Um, I had my little trowels and everything all set out there, worked my way around it. And eventually, eventually, I unearthed this beauty. <laughs> I think it's from Roman times maybe, I think, um, but either way, that has got to be the carpiest spoon with the carpiest story ever, I think. And I've, I've actually named the spoon, I've called it Tony Robinson, <laughs> after the presenter of Time Team, because that's kind of the, the fashion and watch in which it was unearthed and came into my possession really. So there we are, I've got a, a Roman artifact as a spoon. I believe it's from the Roman times. To say on the back, stainless steel. Yeah, it's probably Roman. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> so yeah, interesting story that really, I think. Yeah, um, I'm having some Tesco finest shortbread, Scottish shortbread biscuits. Thank you to, yeah, courtesy of Adam on a, on a tutorial the other month. Thank you very much, Adam. I shall enjoy these. Donk. 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 Look at that. I can do that forever. Yeah. Incredible dunkers. Still got a crunch as well. <laughs> Mental, isn't it? Mental. The following week it was time for more tutorials and this time I was down at East Elf Lakes near Peterborough. I started the week with Craig and Anthony who I had for 48 hours and conditions on this session couldn't have been much better. It was warm, windy, low pressure, and Anthony got things rolling going into the first night with a really nice golf speed. A couple more fish followed that night, and by keeping the bait going in on a little and often basis, we were able to keep bites coming right through to the following day. Um, we are just using the Pacific tuna boilies, coated in the hot chorizo liquid. And I do find that the, the fish in there really do respond well to them red fish mills, especially the bigger fish, as Anthony found out going into the second night. So this is Anthony's third fish of the session, is it? Yeah. And I've just weighed this one, and what did it weigh? 17, six. Um, what did I say it weighed? 17.6? Seven, yeah, I lied. Go on. It was 23 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that makes it your... PB. New PB. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, mate. Well done. <laughs> Brilliant, mate. Brilliant. You know, I've done all that as well. You'll never forget that fish, we had a right chew on it. Snagged us in the uh, tree down the margin. Had to go out in the boat to land it, proper battle. Well done, mate, you'll never forget that fish. That's awesome. <laughs> Action had been fairly slow for me on this session but i don't mind waiting a while between bites when something like this comes along well just the one fish for me last night but what a fish it is real nice solid chunky mirror of 26 pounds 12 ounces i push the head towards me a bit push the head towards me a bit very bossy do you, do you james want to get your knees out of the way they look horrible so kneel down something. leave his knees alone no i don't like them mm, man's knees <laughs> So with Craig and Anthony having gone back home to Liverpool happy, I then had James for 24 hours and it didn't take him long to get things up and running. So a mega start to the session for James. Been fishing what, about two and a half hours? Yeah. Finally ripped into a bit of action. Yeah, and uh, we've got your PB Ghosty here. Not your PB, but definitely your PB Ghosty. Yep. 22 12. Great start, mate. Well done. Now, because action was a little bit slow for me on this occasion, and having caught a PB eel on my previous session down at East Elf Lakes, albeit accidentally. I decided to do something a little bit mental and swap one of the cart rods over for a eel rod. 
Um, I've never done this before. I've never purposely targeted eels. Um, so I give, I give my mate Matt Rand, who's one of the fox predator consultants, a call. He's a bit of a, an eel expert. It's fly, go away. <laughs> and he gave me a few pointers on what to do. So following his advice, I rigged up with a, a, a running paternoster setup um, and a 45 pound um, armadillo hook link, uh, a single size two hook. And I was fishing with small sections of roach. And I didn't know what to expect to be honest. I thought I might have to wait hours for a bite, but that really wasn't the case at all. So a lot of people always say how hard eels are to hold when you're trying to get photos or unhook them. But one tip is to lay them on the backs and stroke the belly and they seem to go into almost a, a trance-like state like this one has. So you should now be quite easy to hold, should be. There we go. Look at that. So this is my first ever eel caught by design. Um, the carp fishing has been quite slow so far today. So I reeled in one of the carp rods and uh, set up a running ledger rig with a long um, armadillo hook link, size four hook, and mounted a small dead roach. Rob was in five minutes. And here we go, got an eel of about pound and a half. Not a monster by any means, but like I say, it's the first one I've ever intentionally caught. So I'm, I'm really chuffed with that. So having now got a taste for eel fishing, I um, carried on with that one eel rod into the night and action was absolutely frantic. I think I can't have gone much more than five minutes without getting some sort of action, either a run or a, or a missed run. Um, I think I landed about, about a dozen eels in total, but must have missed more than twice that in the amount of runs. Um, so yeah, I, I'm by no means a, an eel expert. I'm sure someone who knew what they were doing would have been able to uh, tweak things around and convert a lot more of those missed runs into fish on the bank. But either way, it was very, very enjoyable. Um, didn't catch anything large at all, um, didn't manage to break my eel PB, but um, I give it till about three o'clock in the morning before I was, I was absolutely shattered and then I switched it back over to the, to the carp rods and um, yeah, I, I'm kind of glad I did to be honest because um, the next morning the, the rod that I swapped for the eel rod rattled off with this fella. So just the one fish for me last night but what an absolute cracker. Look at that for a ghosty. 20 pounds, eight ounces. I feel I need to share something with you. Okay. I'm gonna show you the biggest edge in barista technology. Okay. It's, uh, it's called the high paw. And what it does, it oxygenates your brew. You need to get. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's impressive, isn't it? There you go. That was impressive. That was impressive, wasn't it? Yeah. And um, it, it kind of, what it does, it kind of creates like a cappuccino froth without it being a cappuccino. I mean, look at the head on that. That's a, cr it's gone down now. It did have a good head. It had a cracking head on it, that did but you can really taste the oxygen. That's the thing, that's where it's at. Mmm, oxygen-y. That's the one. <laughs> that's the one. Well, having got home from East Delft, I just about had enough time to grab a quick shower and then I took the kids down to Stokesley Fair which comes to the town every September. Don't drop your phone. No, I'll try not to. And the part where you go
The following week I was back down at Stanick for more tutorials and conditions on this session were probably as far from perfect as you can imagine. Um, air pressure is the highest I've known it in a very long time, 1,040 air pressure. The nighttime temperatures were well in the, in the low single figures and daytime temperatures were very high. So big swings in temperature, mega high air pressure. It just wasn't the one. Now I started the week with John and we decided to go on Elson's even though it hadn't produced a fish in five days. And it certainly looked like it was going to be really, really tough going. While Elson's was proving to be as tough as I thought it was going to be, that didn't seem to be the case over on Roman, the Syndicate Lake next door. Well, nothing happened over on Elson's last night. I've just had a phone call from my mate Brad who's fishing over on Roman and he's had a proper chunk. So I'm just headed off over there now to take a few, a few pictures for him. Reveal yourself to me. Look at that. So is this thirty eight two? Yeah. Roger. But you are. Epic. I'm hanging about that one. Well done, mate. Good skills, good skills. Thank you. It wasn't long after Brad had slipped back his 38 pounder when I received a take out of the blue over on Elson's. So it really wasn't looking good for a bite this morning. I was watching fish cruising around in the upper layers. Lake was flat calm, no signs of feeding fish at all. And out the blue, the rod rips off with this absolutely awesome, classic looking 25 pound three ounce common. Really, really chuffed with this one. I was not expecting this bite at all. With the air pressure as high as it was, through this session we'd pretty much just fish zigs through the day uh, and, and into the night. And it wasn't until the following morning, just an hour before John had to leave, one of his rods finally went. If he does want to go under there, you have to get wet. Huh? It's grating. It's grating. Oh, don't be saying things like that. He's all right. He's, he's fine. He's, he's absolutely fine. I right, just, just sort of play him nice and gently. He's moving away from it now, so just... You're doing good, mate. A bit of close up action. It's a mirror. It's a mirror? Yeah. That's unlucky. <laughs> it doesn't matter, mate. It doesn't At matter. At the moment, anything matter. is a mega, mega result. It's a mega result. I feel proper on edge. I feel really nervous. <laughs> My heart's pounding. I bet yours is. No, no, you don't need to. Don't rush him. <sighs> yes, Phil. Go on, Please, Phil. Phil. Go on, <laughs> Phil. Yes. You, Phil. Told you he was a good netsman, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is fantastic. <laughs> Awesome! Oh, fist, me, hell, fist me, fist me, fist me! I need to film the fist. Can't see the fist. <laughs> amazing. That is brilliant. <laughs> so it has been proper tough going this session. We always knew it was going to be hard going before we'd even got down to the lake really with the air pressure being as high as it was and hadn't been a fish out of the lake for four days. Heard you like a challenge. Exactly. <laughs> he's a character, I'll say that. He's, he's uh, the fish I'm on about, not, not John. Well, John is as well, obviously. 
But uh, the first fish I'd like in five days, 21.7, we're going with, I think, on this one, which fell to a, uh, just an all black zig, fished around a foot under the surface. And yeah, I feel relieved that you've caught. And I think you do as well, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> Nerve wracking getting it in, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. I think we were all feeling it. <laughs> No, that is really good going, mate. Well done, you've, uh, you've worked hard this session. Thank well you, done. It's been great. With John having pulled out the bag right at the dying moments, I then had AD for 24 hours. And with Elson's fishing as tricky as it was, AD decided to go over onto Mallard Lake for his session. So just a one fish for AD last night, but what a fish it is. That's an absolute banger. This fell to a um, Pacific tuna, caught ball pop up. Just fishing a hole in the weed, a light scattering a bait around it. But yeah, that is that is stunning, mate. Well done. Cheers, mate, thank you. I think where you are, I do think it's more of a daytime area. So I think there's definitely a chance of a, another fish or two before the session's out. So we'll uh, just have to wait and see, I guess. AD managed to put a couple of nice fish on the bank over on Mallard and I then had Lee for 24 hours. Now Lee wanted to try his luck over on Elson's. Again he wanted to learn about fishing on weedy pressured waters uh, but unfortunately the fishing it, it really did switch off again. It was just seen there was just those fleeting opportunities around the lake. Uh, you had to be in the right place at the right time and uh, unfortunately on that occasion we weren't but we managed to salvage a blank we went over onto swan for the final half an hour of the session and stalk one right out the edge actually we need to make it a bit more karate bear with me oh, we need like a big old big, big oh, oh that's one wet it Oh yes, that is the one. <laughs> You're laughing at. <laughs> um, well, that's just about me done for this afternoon. It's been quite a productive few hours work for me over on the island, clearing trees. And the reason behind me doing this is to reduce the amount of leaf matter going into the lake, which will in turn result in a, a build-up of silt. Um, so yeah, it's going to be an ongoing job, really. But right now, I'm going to head back over to the bank and uh, get the kettle on. And I'm going to tell you a bit more about something I mentioned in last month's carp life. Um, I did mention I've got a rather exciting project I'm working with, with CC Moore. So uh, yeah, let me get a brew and I'll tell you more about that. Look at the head on that. That's what you want. That's what you want. That's a cracking head. Look at the head on that. That is ultra oxygenation. That's super saturated that. I won't, I won't drink hot beverage if it's had an oxygen crash. There's just no point. Mm, that is oxygeny. <laughs> that is really <laughs> Oh yeah, you can taste that oxygen. So here I have the latest stage of my own personal hook baits that I've been working on with the guys at CC Moore. Um, now I say the latest stage, th th there has been quite a few, quite a few stages. Um, in fact, you may have seen a very sneak peek of them in the challenge episode 17 I think it was that we filmed back in March on Cuttle Mill. I was using some washed out pop-ups then and that's pretty much what this is based around. That is a, uh, a flavour combination that I've used for the past 20 years. Uh, it's, it's, it's an old school flavour combo 
but the guys at CC More have got access to so many more flavours, liquids, additives than I have. Um, they're able to um, give it a, a bit of a, a modern twist. Um, I mean, like I say, that was that was like the stage three, stage two, stage one, and even that is um, leading on from all the different flavour combos that came before it. Um, I think we tried about what's here. I think twelve different flavour combinations before I settled on this one to then move forward and, and work on with. Um, so yeah, it's it's still it's still in the development stages. Um, it's going to need a good a good winter's testing, so we'll have a, a full season of testing, and then hopefully we can uh, get it right, put those final touches to it, and maybe release it next spring. Well, having spent so much time away from home in September, I finished the month by spending some good time with with the family, and living where I do in the northeast of England, I like to get my girls outdoors it gives them and me a break from seeing them glued to their phones and laptops and I do like to take them for, for, for hikes up on the on the moors and the hills. You two stay together because there's lots of wolves in these woods. There's not. There is but um, they're only attracted by pink so as long as you're not wearing pink you'll be all right so oh yeah sorry. <laughs> Come on, you're all right. No, I'm staying behind you. <laughs> so that was September, and the month started off by being a little bit frustrating. Failing that challenge did hurt, and especially considering that it was, on some levels, a pass. The tough conditions that we experienced through the most part of September, men's, it was tricky going on quite a few of the tutorials, but still there were some fantastic fish caught, including a few PBs too. And that brings us up to October, which has already been a very full on month. I've started taking bookings for my Waynestones poll, which opens in 2020. And I'm now in my final month of tutorials before I have a winter break. And there's already been some fantastic fish caught. So I look forward to telling you all about them next month. See you then. Don't worry, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs>